Okay, looks like we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview with the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society, Buffalo, New York, 25th of October, 2006, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My full name is Fred Tomasolo, Jr. The date of birth is September 2nd, 1944, and the place was Tampa, Florida. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I had a Bachelor of Arts in English and Speech Education from the University of South Florida in Tampa. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Okay. Why? I thought it was a patriotic thing to do at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was in college and they had a program for officer candidate school. So I wanted to get into that and go in as an officer. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? Because I was really impressed by their uniforms <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and all their history and mythology and tradition. Okay. Um, when did you go in? I went in in the uh, summer between my sophomore and junior year to the PLC program, mm -hmm. the Tuna Leaders class for six weeks. And then the following summer I went again for six weeks between my junior and senior year in college. And I, once I passed the PLC program, I went active in, uh, I think it was December of 66. Okay. So you were commissioned as a second lieutenant then? Second lieutenant, right. Then I went to the basic school for I think six, six months. Mm -hmm. And then we all went right over to Vietnam, nearly all of us. Do you think in retrospect you were prepared for what you saw over there? That's a good question. Yeah, I think we were sort of prepared uh, militarily to, I was prepared to lead these guys, but tactics, uh, I think we were, we didn't have the right tactics to fight a guerrilla war. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lost a lot of people because of that. But we had overpowering uh, you know, weapons, we had air power, we had everything we needed, but we just walked around like an elephant saying, shoot us so we can kill you. Mm -hmm. You know, battalion size operation, there's no stealth involved in that. You just walk around until somebody shoots at you. Okay. Um, what unit were you assigned to? Initially, the 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, Golf Company. Mm -hmm. I took over the 2nd Platoon of Golf Company. All right. Um, did you go over as a replacement officer, or did you go over as a unit? Or? No, I was a replacement yeah. officer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think any part of no, was right. as a unit. Yes. Uh, how did you uh, go over to Vietnam? On brand new airlines, mm -hmm. which was, this was interesting because I thought <clears throat> there was shooting going on every day, and the plane landed in Da Nang, and there was no shooting. You know, and the, we had stewardesses that changed their uniform in flight which was Brannis, one of their, I guess, marketing points then. But it was really interesting because it, it wasn't what I expected immediately. Mm -hmm. um, when did you arrive? I don't remember the exact day. Okay. Well, what month and year? Do you... I have to look at my Okay, eyes. that's okay. Yeah. Um, what were your, were your impressions when you arrived there? You got In off Da Nang, the plane? Da Nang was a big base. Uh, they didn't have uh, enough room for us in the regular uh, quarters, so we had to stay near the runway. And all night long, these Phantom Jets were taking off with their afterburners because the runway was short. So we didn't get any sleep at all, but mm -hmm. it was really exciting to sit next to the runway and watch uh, big jets take off mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you finally get to your unit? About uh, three or four days later, I took over my unit at a bridge called the KGO Bridge off of Highway 9. It was a reinforced platoon. I had over 100 guys. I had uh, Army uh, dusters. I had 81 mortars, 60 millimeter mortars, two tanks, a bunch of machine guns. Uh, it was Army and Marines mixed. Mm -hmm. How were you received as a new man in country? <laughs> I'm sure it was skepticism. Uh -huh. I learned a lot from a lance, from a corporal mm -hmm. that, was, uh, one, that was manning the radio at nights. Uh, he taught me a lot about the, how stupid it was to send out patrols like over a thousand meters at night, a thousand yards. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him. And I changed 
the strategy that, from what the lieutenant before me was doing, and I think I gained the support of the men almost immediately when they realized that uh, I was looking out for their welfare. Mm -hmm. In what ways did you change? I didn't send, I went out with an ambush one night and a thousand meters was way too far to go at night. So I only sent them out like, you know, three or four hundred yards, five hundred yards at the most. Mm -hmm. And because I went out with them, they felt that I was willing to do anything that I commanded them to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that means a lot. Did you make any contact on these ambushes? No, no we didn't, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. no. It was a pretty quiet time. No, in the area where you were, you were fighting mostly the North Vietnamese, or yes. always the North Vietnamese? Pretty much, yeah. When we did make contact, they had uniforms, helmets, uh, packs, you know, weapons, everything. Mm -hmm. They had artillery, they had mortars, they had recoilless rifles. Now, what kind of weapon did you yourself carry? I carried a 45 under my flak jacket, and I carried an M16 so that I looked like the rest of my men when we mm -hmm. went out on patrols. Did you have any rank on it at all? Or I had a lieutenant bar on, on my little pocket, mm -hmm. on my flat jacket. Okay. And it was kind of tarnished, it didn't shine or show mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. When were you under fire the first time? The 30th of November, 1967. We were in a battalion sized operation, four companies in a, like a box formation. And the MVA opened up from right in, in the middle of us. And we suffered dead and wounded right away. And when we returned fire, we ended up shooting over each other. And possibly we may have wounded and killed each other. Mm -hmm. It was a mess. <clears throat> what were your particular feelings? It was, it was an adrenaline high like I've never experienced in my life. I was real tired from walking all day, humping with a bunch of heavy weight on my back and all that. But when that shooting started, man, it just, the uh, electricity went through us. But then there was complete chaos. And no matter how hard we tried, it was hard to get young guys to stop shooting when we were getting shooting at, when we were getting shot at. You know, and there were green tracers from the North Vietnamese and orange tracers. I'm colorblind, so my men had to tell me which ones were the enemy tracers. But there were tracers flying all around us. and. Uh, it was hard to get everything sorted out. How close were you to the enemy at that point? We were very close. We were like uh, 30, 40 yards away with them. Mm -hmm. throwing, we could almost throw a grenade that far. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm excited, I can throw them pretty far. Yeah. And uh, we killed about 12, my machine guns killed about 12 of them that day. Mm -hmm. But then we had to pull out our dead and wounded, and our company got, got uh, isolated from the rest of the battalion. And so we had to to move in on, at, at dark, back into their lines. And that was pretty scary, carrying about, I don't know, about 20 or 30 dead, a whole bunch of wounded on ponchos. Mm -hmm. And then it started raining and it was dark. It was not, not any fun at all. Now what were your living, daily living conditions like? Uh, we were living in the field. It was, you lived in a hole. You dug a hole every night. And you slept in there, and if the hole was full of water, you usually slept on the edge of it. And then when you took income, and you rolled into the hole, because you had to get undercover, you know, unless you want to get wounded or something. Living conditions in the field. Living conditions in the rear, like at Camp Carroll, we had hardback tents, which mm -hmm. were two by four frames with uh, olive drab tent material over them. Mm -hmm. And we had cots with, uh, some people even had mattresses or air mattresses, we used to call them rubber bitches, rubber ladies. Mm -hmm. And we blew them things up and slept on those and they were great. Yeah. What about chow? Was it sea rations most of the time? Yeah, in uh, Camp Carroll there was a mess hall and uh, they had a different type of ration, but in the field we always had sea rations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cans and cans of food. Did you ever get the LERP rations? I, I traded some one time with an army guy, the long range recon yeah. control rations. Yeah, and they were great. Yeah. Hot water, and man, we had, I think it was spaghetti with meat sauce. Yeah. Was my favorite. That, well, they were awesome. The army, I felt, always had better equipment, better food, uh, just better everything than, than, than what the Marines had. What were your feelings about the M16? The M16 was a piece of trash. Piece of trash. 
that thing jammed up. You had to keep everything immaculately clean. And even if you kept it clean, after a few rounds were fired, it had a tendency of failure to extract. That little tiny extractor would not pull out that, that spent casing. It would just pop it right off and you'd have a spent casing in there. The next round would feed and you had a failure to feed, you had a jam. And a lot of the men carried a, a cleaning rod mm -hmm. to take to the side of their M16. So it was like Civil War days, you had to push that thing down in there and take that empty shell out in order to commence firing again. It was a piece of trash. Mm -hmm. And at one point, my platoon finally got comfortable with the round 16s and we had the three-pronged flash suppressor at the end. For opening open. C ration cases. Yes, yeah, yeah, you could open them, you could do a lot of things with them. However, the military claimed that they jammed in the bushes and mm -hmm. they made us, they forced us, replace those M16s with ones that had like a little ring uh, welded around that the three prong flash suppressor. So we had to go through the whole process again mm -hmm. of sort of getting weapons that jammed all the time. It was almost a mutiny. Mm -hmm. Did any of the guys carry AKs? No. We had a captain that carried a 30 caliber carbine. And one night we were getting probed on the lines and he fired off a few rounds. And of course, the, the South Vietnamese and the, the uh, the Viet Cong carried 30 caliber carbines too, that mm -hmm. distinctive pock, pock, pock. The whole lines opened up on them, so he threw it down, never <laughs> carried it again. Our gunny sergeant carried a pump, a 12 gauge shotgun. One lieutenant carried a World War II 45 caliber grease gun. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of the men carried uh, the weapons that we were, we were issued. How about your fellow officers? How did you feel about them? They were good. <laughs> we were. One of them was a little crazy, that one lieutenant, but uh, well, I say he was crazy because he carried C4 and blasting caps in the same pack. And he crimped them, crimped the blasting caps with his teeth and they taught us not to do that. He's the one that carried the grease gun. And uh, I thought the fellow officers were, you know, the majority of them were doing a good job trying to look out for the welfare of their men. And, mm -hmm. You know, after a while, we tried to accomplish the mission, but after a while, it became more important to make sure that everybody got back okay. Because you were there 12 months and 20 days in the Marine Corps. And, you know, 12 and 20, and you go home, and that's what really mattered. How about the enlisted men you, you had on you? How did you feel about them? They were good men. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have uh, work with the South Vietnamese Army at all? No. Units? Or no. Contact the South Vietnamese people at all? The villagers or mm -hmm. the soldiers? The villagers, villagers yeah. yeah. We, we contacted with them a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, whenever we had a, a cordon operation, we would surround the ville, you know, and secure it in, in the middle of the night. And then the Arvins, the uh, Republic of Vietnam troops, would go in and do all the searching and the slapping around mm -hmm. and, and stealing pots and pans and chickens and whatever they did. And I. I don't recall ever getting any good intelligence or anything from their actions, but we did not, uh, you know, have too much personal contact with mm -hmm. the villagers at all. In fact, we had a, a, a free fire zone north of the Campbell River, so whenever we operated in there, we were free to shoot anything that, that moved. Okay, um, you were wounded twice? Yeah, once in 67 with the, with the grunts on the ground and once in 68 mm -hmm. in the bird dog section. You want to talk about those two incidences? Well, the first time it was on a patrol and uh, the, the platoons that had gone, the three platoons, the two platoons before us that had gone there had gotten hit with mortars. And then our day came and it was our turn and we begged the captain to call in an airstrike, a B-52 strike. And uh, he did get a flight of fixed wing in there. But when we walked across that, that flooded paddy and river and got to the other side, we got hit also. Had two mortar rounds landed right in the middle of us. And it uh, wounded one of my guys very severely, took off two legs at the thigh. And uh, I had shrapnel on my shoulder. A piece of shrapnel went through the steel of my helmet and stopped at the helmet liner. And my ear was bleeding, so I thought I was hitting the head. Then I found out later that the guys didn't want to tell me about the, the head wound because they thought if I took my helmet off that my brains would fall out or something. But uh, I couldn't lift my arm and so I noticed that 
one of the men noticed there was two tiny holes in the, my uh, rain jacket, my rain suit, where, the, where your arm comes out of your flat jacket, so I got wounded there. And I got medevaced after we medevaced, or seriously wounded. I think about six or seven of our guys got wounded that day. And I went to Dong Ha, Battalion Aid Station, and I saw the uh, corporal a gardener that was wounded. He seemed to be okay. They had him on a stretcher. Both his feet were up there, like as if they're more for moral support than anything else. And uh, I, I didn't hear, we didn't hear from him after that. But I heard that he lived, so mm -hmm. that was good. And then I had a, they couldn't get all the pieces out, so I left a couple in there and left a tube hanging that I was supposed to see a corpsman every day and they pull it out a little bit at a time so the wound healed mm -hmm. from the inside out. And then I went back in the field about 13 days later and just in time to walk the platoon back into Camp Carroll again for another rest period. How long did those rest periods last? Usually a couple weeks, a week or two. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we'd be out again on another operation. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you do during the rest periods and the rest? <laughs> well, you, if we were manning the lines, I, of course, checked the lines every night. If we weren't, we were in the rear. I let the men do whatever they want as long as they didn't hurt each other. And I never messed with them. Uh, we got a new captain one time, and he wanted to do exercise, live fire exercises. And he was a jerk. We told him that this wasn't the right place for it, and he insisted on doing a single envelopment live fire exercise. And my platoon went first, and uh, he wanted me to brief the men using the five paragraph order, SMEAC, situation, mission, execution, the whole by the book stuff, you know. And so I did, and I told the men, watch for your fire discipline, you know, and make sure that when the the base of fire is shooting and not everybody runs out of ammo at the same time when they pop the white smoke and the, the other squad envelops through the objective, base of fire stops shooting, all right? Well, everything started going good. They shot the white smoke. The base of fire stopped shooting. The squad that was doing the single envelopment started going uphill and they're shooting. They all run out of ammo at once. So the corporal that was in charge, Panero, he, he hears the silence and he knows that I warned him about, you know, fire discipline. So he pulls out a grenade and throws it uphill. The grenade rolls back down and goes off and he wounds himself. Okay, so I told the captain, I said, you need to cut out this. This is not the, you know, we, don't, we can't be doing this stuff. Now I want the next platoon to do it. The next platoon does it. They pop the white smoke and their squad starts walking through the objective and the base of fire keeps shooting and they kill one or two of our own guys. And finally, then he, he knocked it off. You had a kind of a humor story about a colonel going to the bathroom. Oh yeah, that yeah that was <laughs> at uh, that was at Dong Ha when I was in the bird dog section. They had a separated had junior officers in one area, and senior officers in another, and I saw the explosive ordnance disposal team, the EOD team, go off in their truck, right, and this full bird colonel goes to the toilet. They had a, the outhouse and he's sitting in there and they set off this huge explosion and this guy comes out running out of there he thinks we're taking income and his ankle his trousers are down around his ankles and his full bird kernel insignias are glinting in the sun and he stumbles and falls and I had to run inside because I was laughing so hard yeah. <laughs> yeah that was humorous now how did you end up in the aviation well, they made me executive officer because I had been wounded once and I was married. And I saw a notice for a job opening that they needed some forward air controllers. So I applied for it and I got it. So I joined the bird dog section and I sat in the back seat of the Piper Cub. Did you uh, have to go away for any training or was it OJT? It was OJT, yeah, OJT. And uh, called in airstrikes, naval gunfire, artillery, uh, everything. And, close air support for the troops on the ground. Now you mentioned before uh, we started the interview um, about Army helicopters coming in and you have some respect for them. Would you talk about that? One operation, it was a huge operation. Uh, our Marines took fire 
crisscrossing 50 calibers from two hilltops and demolished a helicopter on the ground. So we had dead and wounded on a hilltop. And I called in for marine helicopters to medevac them while I was getting close air support to bomb the two hilltops. And they refused to go in. An army helicopter, uh, Hueys, mm -hmm. went in and picked up our wounded, our marine wounded. So I have the utmost respect for the Army warrant officers and, so, and all the Army guys, Marines, Navy too, whoever. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you hear all these stories about the Marines this, the Marines that. Well, the Army was right there the whole time, you know, and that's all a lot of BS. Now, when did you receive your second uh, wound? It was on December the, the 8th, I think it was. No, I'm sorry, August the... Uh, August the 14th, I forgot the exact date. You didn't, uh, yeah. You want to tell us about how that happened? August the 4th was the second one. Yeah, we were flying, uh, what we call trolling along the, deep, along the DMZ, along the river, looking for targets. And the radio operator, I was talking to the radio operator in Kantian, and I noticed four puffs of smoke from up north. And I told him, stand by and let me know if you get four rounds of artillery. And sure enough, four artillery rounds landed at Contient. So I said, well, I got their gun spotted. And I was flying with an Army warrant officer. So I told him, let's go up there. And I want to keep my eye where, that, where the puff of smoke came from. Because it's very easy to follow the puff of smoke and lose where the target was. So we went up there, and we were uh, zigzagging. And I called the direct air support center waiting for a flight of jets. Meanwhile, I started artillery on them, and uh, a bullet went up through the floor of the plane and got me in my right calf. And I went on the intercom, the Army guy was called a Mayday. I said, no, man, we're in North Vietnam. You can fly this plane. We're not going down here. He said, oh, I can fly it. So he was still zigzagging, and I waited until another bird dog came on and relieved me. And in the meantime, I tied my, my, uh, my flight suit to like a makeshift tourniquet with the Velcro there. And once we got relieved, we fired our four rockets where I thought the target was, because they were using a big, like a big sheet of plywood, it looked like, covered with, with uh, camouflage. Mm -hmm. And when they raised it up, the gun would shoot, and when they lowered it, you couldn't see anything except the puff of smoke that came mm -hmm. out, a big white bunch of smoke. So anyhow, I let the other bird dog take over, and, we flew to Dong Hai, and, and uh, they operated on me in Dong Hai and took the bullet out. And uh, from there, I was sent to Japan. I went to an army hospital in Japan, and a huge army hospital. And uh, they closed up the top wound where they had taken the bullet out and debreeded the bottom one. And the doctor there told me that I was going to be going home after that. So I almost got up to you know, give him a hug and all that. Dr. Bashant was his name. And uh, then from there I went to all over the United States, finally ended up in Jacksonville, Florida, instead of Tampa. And I stayed in the hospital in Jacksonville for a few months, and that's where I, I got stationed at Marine Barracks. Let me just go back a second. How much time did you spend in country in Vietnam? A little over 10 months, uh -huh. a little over 10 months. Are there any other uh, stories about your time there that you'd like to relate or anything? Did you get yeah. to see any USO shows or anything like that while you were there, Bob Hope or? No. We saw one, it was a Korean show mm -hmm. at Dong Ha. We were glad to get that. Yeah. Yeah. But the worst part of the whole, the whole three years I spent in the Marine Corps was in Jacksonville. Do you want us to stop for a minute? Okay. Making casualty calls in Jacksonville, Florida for 15 months was without a doubt the, the worst experience that I've ever gone through. I would rather get shot three or four times than have to go on one casualty call. 
the first one that I went on was on a wounded in action, WIA. And I thought that was horrible. But the mm -hmm. other lieutenants who had been on them before, you know, that broke me in and taught me how to do it, was all on the job training. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem too bothered by it. And I thought, what the hell's wrong with these guys? And then I went on a killed in action. And I realized that there's a great big difference between going on a WIA and a KIA. And, uh, you know, we wounded those mothers. Mm -hmm. A lot worse than we were wounded. I wish they would have uh, maybe trained us better or something and made us more prepared to do it. But that's the part that has bothered me the most. And you had to do that for 15 months? Yeah. Yeah. And here it is almost 40 years later. And it still hurts. And was that the last ass assignment you had? Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were happy for me to join the rotation. I didn't know. They were saying, oh, man, you're a, you're a good officer. You know, the men seem to like you and all that. Why don't you let us try to get you orders here in Jacksonville? And I said, well, it's either Jacksonville, which is close to Tampa, you know, or Camp Lejeune, playing, mm -hmm. playing Army, playing soldier out in the field and all this stuff. And I said, all right, get me orders here. So as soon as my orders were cut, they said, well, you're on the rotation now. I said, what rotation? All cavity calls. You're going to go on casualty calls now. I said, well, what's that? You know, and they told me what it was. And uh, it, it was bad. Because you had to stay with the family. Oh, it was good that somebody did it. But I really, you know, it was so painful. You had to stay with the family all the way until the headstone came. And their insurance papers were, all their insurance money came and everything was all done. So you had more than in one initial contact with the family. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't help them with the funeral arrangements, everything. Did you have several going on at, at one time? Or? The way we rotated it, I personally never had several going on at one time. Mm -hmm. The, the follow-up calls, yeah, because once, once you adopted that family, they were yours until, until everything was No, it was just you alone with the family, or did you have... Another officer with you or someone with you, it was just you? We took a Navy chaplain with us, but in, in the, all the times that I went, the Navy chaplain just stood there and, and did nothing. We're the ones that made the notification. We're the ones that got the name and phone number for the funeral home. We're the ones that met the body when it came in. Uh, we're the ones that inspected the body escort, set up the, the funeral you know, the firing squad, the presentation of the flag, everything did the fall. And then if they got any medals or awards later on, posthumously, we're the ones that brought the family over and, you know, had the formations and did everything to try to make it a nice ceremony for the families. And then at that point when that was over, you decided to get out of the, the Marine Corps? Or yes. You went into the Marine Corps Reserve? Yes. Did in you fact, have any thoughts of making it a career, or did that pretty much end When I first went in, I was going to make it a career. Mm -hmm. That's ironic, because when I went to the uh, to the basic school, I wanted to be a regular officer instead of reserve. They said, oh, your, your grades aren't really that well. Your academic achievement isn't that good. Your leadership skills are high. So we're not going to let you go regular. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in Vietnam, they came to me and says, oh, you're doing a great job. We want you to go uh, uh, regular now. I says, no, 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 I'll just stay in the reserve and see how it is. And then in Jacksonville, the guy gave me the re-up speech, the major, and uh, he said, Thomas Olo, he says, we really would like for you to stay in, you know. And I said, well, what does the Marine Corps have in store for me? Oh, we'll promote you to captain. And then we'll send you back to Vietnam and you can be a company commander and do it all over again. I told him, sir, you can take this green machine and you can shove it up your ass. He said, what'd you say? I said, you can take the green machine and you can shove it up your ass. And he says, Thomas Sullivan, I don't think you're career material. 
I said, well, don't you write that down there in that evaluation. Thomas Solo is not career material. He said, well, well why? You seem to be doing good. I said, because this, this whole thing is a farce. I said, we need to get other people in here instead of us rotating over and over and going back over there. You know, if we're, if this country's really serious about the war, let's get everybody involved in it. And that was my, the end of my re-up speech. He never asked me again. That was your, your wife with you when you were in Florida? Yes. Yes, she was. Yeah, in fact, I had one, my first daughter was born in Quantico, Virginia. A son born in Jacksonville, and then my, my third child was born after I was out of the service. And that's another thing. Uh, we got a divorce in 1985, and I've got three kids that have nothing to do with me. And I've got nine grandkids that I've never seen. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, the way I was so angry all the time. I mean, angry about everything. And distrustful of management. I spent 27 years in the post office and I fought with just about everybody. I had EEO complaints, grievances, uh, lawsuits. You know, I probably could have had a really great career instead I had a, just a regular career as a supervisor in the post office. But uh, I think it's taken a, Total of my life. Are you getting any sort of counseling at all through the VA? Or? Yeah, I can go whenever I want for counseling, which is good. And I have taken advantage of it. And I went to marriage counseling and I went to individual counseling. The first, you know, and back in the, in the 70s, there was such a stigma associated with, with counseling of any kind. Mm -hmm. You know, you were crazy and a crazy you know, but that I used to sneak over there. Me and my wife would sneak over there so no one would see us. And uh, then after the counselor said, I can't handle both of you at once, she went to one counselor and I stayed with this guy. But he was not a veteran, but he was mm -hmm. a good counselor. Mm -hmm. But he was somebody, you know, just put that behind you and let's move on. And I don't believe in looking at the past and letting that affect you. And he gave me a lot of good advice and calmed me down a lot. And, uh, and then over the years, I've gone to counseling on an as-needed basis whenever I feel real depressed or real angry. And lately there's stuff in the news that always uh, gets me angry. But I'm, I'm, I can go anytime I want mm -hmm. to counseling and they usually restore me back to rational thinking and lessen my anger a lot. And the woman I'm married to now, she, she says, you need to go to counseling. <laughs> you know, she doesn't wait a long time. She just says, you're, you're pissed, go to counseling. Were you um, aware of the anti-war movement going on in the States? Yes, when I was in Vietnam. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, were we were... Feelings? I was kind of hoping they would win so they could get us out of there in a hurry, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was... I thought they were expressing their rights. I thought they had good points, and I think they helped... Uh, shortened the whole length of the war. We would probably still be in, in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos today if it weren't for the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of people may not like to hear that, but I think it's, it's true. The Marine yesterday said the exact same thing. Really? Yes. Good for him. Um, did you ever have any encounters with the uh, protesters at all when you came back? Yeah, in Jacksonville. And it was 19... Uh, 68 or 69, we were going to have a big demonstration, and the base commander was a Navy lieutenant commander, I guess, equal to a lieutenant colonel. There was a commander, his full commander, equal to a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. And he says, Thomas Sullivan says, I want a whole platoon locked and loaded with live ammo and fixed bayonets in front of this Jacksonville base. I don't want any of those protesters getting near the gates and all that. I told him, sir, I don't, I don't really think we need live ammo and fixed bayonets. He says, why? I says, well, if one of those protesters were to spit on one of my Marines or throw a bag of shit on him or something, so that Marine would chase that kid all the way into downtown Jacksonville just to kill him. I said, just leave him, you know, no rifles, no nothing, just bare hands. That's all we need. He says, I'm giving you a direct order. He says, I want your men out there with fixed bayonets. 
I told him, well, sir, I can work for you. I work for Major Green. And so uh, I talked to Major Green when I got back, and he called him, and he straightened it all out. So we didn't have uh, Marines out there locked and loaded with mm -hmm. fixed bayonets. And the protest was very peaceful, and uh, no one got into any, any fist fights or anything. Mm -hmm. So I was glad of that. Do you read any books about Vietnam at all? Yeah, once in a while I've read I've read some books about Vietnam. Is there anything that you stands out that you you particularly liked or I read Fields of Fire, I read Platoon, or I know I saw the movie Platoon, I don't know. Uh, How about movies? Are there any that you particularly care for or Yeah, I like for? Apocalypse now. You do? Apocalypse now it symbolizes uh, the whole bullshit of the whole thing. And uh, oh, and Catch Twenty Two, of course. That, that's <laughs> that's got to be the best movie about war ever made. I mean, that just Yossarian and uh, the marketing guy and the sales of the war and how big business is like taking over the whole thing. Beautiful, beautiful movie, mm -hmm. and good book too. Joseph mm -hmm. Heller, Catch Twenty yes. Two. Uh, after you got out, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes. Yeah, I got another two-year degree in marketing and distributive education, and uh, that's about it. Yeah. Did you use the GI Bill to buy a home or anything? No. Did you join any veterans organizations? Or? Yeah, I joined uh, Vietnam Veterans of Tampa Bay, a life member, and they went defunct. I'm a member of the Military Order of the Purple Heart, life member. I'm a member of the DAV and the American Legion. Are you active in any of no. those? No. Most of them, they just talk about going to conventions and mm -hmm. you know, changing yeah. bylaws and trying to influence Congress, but and then they just sit around drink and tell war stories. Did you stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Yeah, with uh, Tim Hermson and Herman Galindo that were in my platoon. Uh, Herman Galindo lives in Texas, and Hermson lives in uh, Washington State. I went to visit him, and yeah, I stayed in touch with him. And uh, I did stay in touch with Arthur Roberts for a while, but then we lost contact. He was from Palaka, Florida. <clears throat> One other thing, it's something I meant to ask earlier. Did you have any, um, were there any race problems within your unit at all? No, but I remember when Martin Luther King was shot, uh, two guys locked and loaded on each other, a black guy and a white guy. And he says, Lieutenant, we need you over here. These guys are going to kill each other. And I went over there, and uh, the black guy had tears coming out of his eyes. And he says, you know, the white guy says, I'm glad they killed that black motherfucker and all that. And the white guy says, no, I didn't mean it that way. And they were both locked and loaded on each other. And I, I stuck between them, and I said, guys, we've got a war going on, you know. We can't be killing each other, you know. Let's just apologize and say you're sorry. And let's, you know, call it a day here. And they put their weapons down and, and finally shook hands with each other. They were good friends before. Mm -hmm. He just let it slip that he was glad they killed this guy, and the other guy was very upset about it. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in in the service uh, changed or had an effect on your life? made me a lot more cynical and it made me uh, question everything and not to believe everything that we're told. And uh, I guess it exposed me to horrible things at a young age that, that I've had to carry and cover up all the time, the pain and the anguish and the sadness of it. But I definitely don't go around bragging about anything of it, you know, like the old-fashioned war movies, trying to, oh, this is heroic and this is exciting. I don't tell young people that. I tell them it's a uh, it's serious business because you can get killed just as easy as you can kill them. And that that's sobering thought, you know, where we think we're going to just go over there and just kick ass and take names. That's not how it goes. Mm -hmm. I know uh, mentions here you, you're working on a, a memoirs. Yes. How's that coming? 
pretty good. I've got the first draft done. I'm going to go through it again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start looking for an agent and looking for a publisher. But I've got the first draft uh, done, and it's a lot longer than I thought it would be, and I left a lot out. So I don't know what all they're really looking for, but I can certainly modify it. And I'd like to get the message out, you know, for anybody to read and say, hey, this is what happened to this guy, this is probably what's going to happen to you if you go into service now. Well, thank you very much for your information. And that's your platoon? Yeah, yeah, I think we're getting ready to go on an operation. And that's uh, Galindo, that's the guy that took the picture. His nickname was El Toro. And uh, this is Tim Hermson, who I've stayed in contact with. Okay. And uh, Jameson, and Big Sam, Haas, DeShore, Flynn, the guy they called Air Wing. Everybody had like a, a nickname. Uh huh. This was at Camp Carroll, Vietnam, 1967. Okay. Can you get some other photos there, Mike? Yes. If you, you know, again, hold the album up and right. show the ones that yeah. you'd like to include. Yeah, that was me in 1967. Almost 40 years and probably 100 pounds less. Okay, <laughs> and that's you getting in the car also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and Let's that's see. you at the bottom of the page. Yeah, in your utilities. Camp Carroll. Mm -hmm. oh, let me get a shot of Camp Carroll. Yeah, that's a two nine battalion area. And that's a one seven five millimeter gun. They wrote okay. the name Kong Go Go. That's looking at the barrel of an eight inch gun. That's an eight inch gun. That's even bigger than a 175. Here's us getting ready to go on an operation. You jump on the trucks and they truck you up the highway and then everybody gets off and we start walking and sweeping the area. Sergeant Moore, very good squad leader from Georgia. Excellent man. got some North Vietnamese Army helmets and stuff. Helmet had a head in it. And that's, everybody had a big fun with that stuff. Mail call. Anybody that got a package from home, everybody clustered around them to see what was inside. Huh. And you had to share your stuff. This is our Christmas pageant at Camp Carroll in December of 67. Shaving cream for Santa Claus. You can tell if you can't, we've had a lot of, a lot of beers. Uh -huh. Whiskey or whatever the hell we had. One time we only had whiskey and grapefruit juice. Bourbon and grapefruit juice and we drank that. Until we got hammered and threw up. <laughs> And that's a little doll that somebody got and we took some of the hair from the head and glued it onto the pubic area. <laughs> so we fashioned our own poom tang. <laughs> and these are some names off the wall. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.